Good morning. All right, let's see here. Okay, how many of you can tell me what that is? Blob. What? Blob. A what? Blob. A blob. Okay, we got to vote here for a blob. Huh? A boa constrictor. A boa constrictor. Excellent. Who said that? Raise your hand. Very good. And wh where does that uh, come from? The little prince. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, one of my favorite books when I was uh, a, a child. Um, this, of course, was written by the great uh, French aviator and writer, Saint Spiry. And uh, the book starts uh, with this. When I was uh, six years old, uh, I happened to see a picture of a boa constrictor swallowing its prey. And uh, it said in the book that boa constrictors swallow their prey whole because uh, they don't, they're not able to, uh, to chew. And it takes them several months for them to digest their food. So I thought about this for a while. And after several months, I put together my first masterpiece. And um, there it is. And uh, I showed this to the grown-ups. And I asked the grown-ups whether or not this picture frightened them. And they said, why should we be frightened by a picture of a hat? <laughs> now, of course, this was extremely frustrating to the little prince. And so, since they were not able to understand this, I made another picture. And in this picture, I drew, I made it very clear that this was a boa constrictor with an elephant inside it. And this way, the grown-ups could see it clearly. You know, these grown-ups, they always need to have things explained to them. They just never understand anything by themselves, and it is tiresome for children to be always and forever explaining things to them. Now, what was it that, at the time, of course, I, I loved this story. My parents gave me this book, and, and I, I ate it up, and I must have read the, the book um, maybe 10 times. And uh, the, the question is, what, was the, what did the, boa what did the uh, little prince find to be so frustrating? And perhaps what was so frustrating was that these grown-ups uh, were jumping to conclusions. Um, at the very least, it would have been best, of course, if the grown-ups had said, yes, this picture is very frightening. Seeing a picture of a boa constrictor with an elephant inside it is frightening. Uh, but perhaps the next best thing uh, would have been for the grown-up to ask a question like, what is it? <laughs> or can you give me a hint as to what I'm looking at? Or perhaps a more sophisticated grown-up might have asked a question like, uh, you know, what is that little dot uh, over there at, at the end? And does that signify anything? And perhaps I could learn something from that. And the, the uh, frustrations that perhaps the little prince had in trying to deal with the way grown-ups jump to conclusions and, and the way they think is something that is discussed at great, in great detail in another one of my favorite books. And this is a book that came out just a few years ago um, by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. I'm just curious, how many of you have read this? Okay, so a few of you have. Um, how many of you have ever wondered why it is that your, you or your organizations or your peers sometimes make rather strange decisions that don't seem to go uh, according to their own interests? Or why it is at meetings um, that people say things at meetings that are rather strange? Or why projects don't go as well as originally planned? Um, so you read this book and you will, you will see it all. <laughs> You'll understand it. Now, T Kahneman is a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2003. He and his colleague, Amos Tversky, uh, who tragically died a number of years before, um, did pioneering work in thinking about how uh, humans uh, make decisions and how sometimes they will rely on what they refer to as, as biases and heuristics. Uh, to make decisions that don't necessarily fit with their, uh, with their own interests. And one of the problems that uh, humans uh, have uh, was nicely illustrated by the comedian Daniel Kay. Uh, Daniel Kay was one of uh, Kahneman's favorites. And uh, he remembers Don Daniel Kay making um, a, a comment about someone whom he didn't particularly like. He said, her favorite position is beside herself and her favorite sport is jumping to conclusions. Now, um, uh, Kahneman spent a lot of time thinking about and studying why it is that um, people jump to conclusions. And uh, part of it is due to this phenomenon, which we refer to as Wysati, W-Y-S-I-A-T-I. What you see is all there is. 
And essentially what this boils down to is that um, when people are faced with a small amount of evidence or a brief story uh, or, or uh, a brief um, uh, anecdote, they try to put together a coherent story and they will jump to conclusions rather than trying to go deeper, rather than asking questions, rather than uh, carefully sifting through the evidence to figure out what's really going on. And of course, that is something which is inherent, inherent to the scientific approach of doing things, which brings me to another one of my favorite books. Uh, this also came out a few years ago called uh, Ignorance, How It Drives Science by Stuart Firestein, who's a biologist at Columbia University. How many of you have read this book? Okay, so this book, the way I found out about it was I listened to Science Friday on a Friday afternoon driving home and I heard Firestein being interviewed. I said, this sounds fascinating, I've got to read this. Um, so Firestein, you'll notice that on the cover of this book is a gigantic question mark. And he points out that ignorance is something to celebrate. Ignorance is why we make progress. Ignorance is what leads to questions. And ultimately what science is all about is asking questions. And what Feierstein writes in the book is that scientists, especially young ones, get enamored over results. Uh, but that's wrong. What great scientists do, the pioneers whom we admire, they're not concerned with results, but they're concerned with the next questions. Two things that scientists do. They ask questions, and they're not afraid to ask questions, and they're not afraid to show off their ignorance. Like they wouldn't be afraid to say to the little kid, what's that? I don't have a clue what that is a picture of. And the other thing that they are not afraid to do is to question, is to question whatever the conventional wisdom happens to be at the time. Which brings me to another one of my favorite books. Um, this is Stephen Johnson's The Ghost Map. I'm just curious to know how many of you have read this one? Okay, so some of you have read this one. So I'm giving you a lot of assigned reading today in case you're worried about whether or not you're going to have anything to read between now and, and say the Christmas holidays, you have nothing to worry about. We, ha we have more coming up. Um, this is also an absolutely fascinating read. This is the story of the Broad Street Pump, uh, what some people refer to as the initial investigation that led to uh, modern epidemiology. John Snow was a uh, dentist, anesthesiologist, physician who was living in London in the 1860s and he was uh, particularly concerned with what was then the major public health menace of the time, which was cholera. Cholera was, was killing tens of thousands of people. And nobody really knew what, what caused it, but there was a conventional wisdom. And the conventional wisdom was that it was caused by um, miasma. Miasma was this horrible smell which was caused by the accumulation of human waste. Uh, and um, people did not know what to do with this. Um, the human waste was continuously accumulating and, and they had no good way of getting rid of it. And the thought was is that the smell from this stuff is what led to the development of cholera. And uh, John Snow had a different idea. Now it wasn't just John Snow, it was John Snow and, and a, a number of other people, but they poured over um, lots and lots of data. Turns out in London there were every week uh, the, um, the, uh, the central government posted a uh, list of all the births and deaths that occurred in London. So there was a continuous de de an up to date death registry. By the way, here in the United States of America in 2014, we do not have an up to date death registry. That's a, another story. And, uh, and based on this, he tried to, uh, he came up with this hypothesis that. Perhaps it wasn't miasma, perhaps it was the water supply. And then that led to him mapping out where the various cases of cholera were, and he figured out um, that it was related to uh, a contaminant within the Broad Street pump. And then once the Broad Street pump was closed down, the cholera epidemic went away. And this eventually then led to the, uh, the building of the sewer system in London. And with the building of the sewer system in London, the cholera epidemic disappeared. Now this was a major triumph of public health, not only of public health, but also of public health science. What John Snow and Reverend White and, the, and, the coll and, his coll and their colleagues did was a beautiful piece of science. And this beautiful piece of science then led to the building of the sanitation systems, which then led to essentially the elimination of cholera within the big cities. This is a plot of death rates in New York City. 
And one sees it in the 19th century, death rates were exceedingly high, and those spikes uh, primarily uh, correlated with the cholera epidemics. And then with the building of the, uh, of the sanitation, the, uh, the cholera epidemics uh, went away, and the death rates went way down. Now, before the sanitation system was built, what were the public health experts telling the public? What was their advice to people about uh, what to do to prevent cholera. Uh, and like uh, the adults, um, those grown-ups who were talking to the little prince, they jumped to conclusions, and they had all kinds of sage advice. So here's an example. Notice, this is from the uh, Commissioner of Health for the City of New York, uh, preventives of cholera. Be temperate in eating and drinking, exclamation point. Uh, abstain from cold water. Uh, you should eat vegetables. Oh, yeah, avoid raw vegetables and unripe fruit. Um, okay, let's see. Abstain from cold water uh, when heated, uh, and above all, from ardent spirits. Somebody after the conference will tell me what that means. Um, and um, if, um, if habit have rendered them indispensable, take much less than usual. Sleep and clothe warm. Do not sleep in a draught of air. Avoid getting wet. Attend immediately to all disorders of the bowels. That's probably good advice. Take no medicine without advice. That's probably good advice. And this is from uh, the commissioner of the, uh, of the Sanitary Commission in the City of New York. By the way, I want to thank um, Tom Farley, uh, who um, was formerly the commissioner of health in the City of New York. I, I attended a talk that he gave and had an opportunity to talk with him, and he uh, pointed me to these slides. What's the point here? The point here is that this is all behavior. What the public health experts were telling people to do was to focus on their behavior. And of course, we now know this had absolutely nothing to do with what was causing cholera. What was causing cholera was a toxin in the environment. And what had to happen was that that toxin had to be removed. And once that toxin was removed, cholera went away. Today, we are faced with another major public health epidemic, and that's the epidemic of obesity. And some people have argued including uh, Commissioner Farley, that this is also caused by toxins in the environment. So what are today's toxins? So this just brings us to um, another book that I recently read um, by the Pulitzer Prize winner reporter Michael Moss called Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. How many of you have read this book? Oh, come on. <laughs> OK. All right, so a few of you have read this book. Um, for those of you who are interested in obesity, you got to read this. Um, this is, um, it's a long read. It's uh, encyclopedic. It's very, very detailed. But he describes actually the science of food. Uh, or, or maybe I should call, say this differently, the science of processed food. And how the food uh, companies um, brought in some brilliant minds to design the foods, processed foods, um, that we currently eat. Now, one of the most interesting stories um, in this book um, about salt, sugar, and fat, which are the toxins that we now see much more of in our environment than we saw 50 years ago, uh, an interesting story is that is Jeffrey Dunn. Uh, Dunn uh, was the son of an executive at Coca-Cola. And he went into the business, and uh, he was a brilliant businessman, and he rose up in the ranks to the point where he became the president of the North American and South American divisions. And he was on his way to become the CEO of the company. And then what happened was that in 2001, he was down in Brazil. So this was a country that uh, Coca-Cola was very excited about. And he said, I, I looked at the kids there, and I saw how fat they were, uh, and my heart uh, sank. And uh, he had realized that uh, the company had gone too far. And he said, the obesity trend is an epidemic. There is no question that its roots are directly tied to the expansion of fast food, junk food, and soft drink consumption. What's also interesting in this book, he, he describes how, and this is amazing, I don't know how he was able to do this, but a number of the executives of the food companies talked with him. And without exception, Every single one of them said that they go out of their way to avoid eating the products that their companies make because they know just how dangerous they are. And so there have been efforts uh, to try to get rid of these toxins. Now this, of course, 
is a lot less straightforward than, uh, than the sewer system for getting rid of human waste. Um, and so this leads to a question of what is an appropriate strategy for preventing obesity. And so this then leads to another one of my favorite books. Uh, this is The Strategy uh, of Preventive Medicine by Jeffrey Rose. How many of you have read this book? Okay, a few of you have read this book. Okay, so this is, um, this is really a must. This is a, a classic, I, I would call this a classic in, in epidemiology. It was written about 20 some years ago. Uh, Jeffrey Rose, an epidemiologist at the London School of uh, Tropical Hygiene. And he differentiated between two kinds of prevention, the uh, clinical approach and the population approach. So the clinical approach consists of identifying high-risk people. So these might be, uh, for example, children who are already overweight, or children of overweight parents, um, or children who are already obese, um, versus the population approach. The population approach says you look at the entire population. So the clinical approach is within the, the realm of the doctor's office, uh, or within the realm of, of individuals. The population approach deals with entire populations. Uh, so um, one of the points that he makes is, is that if you look at any, any kind of uh, illness which is due to an extreme, like high blood pressure, that's an extreme of, of elevated blood pressure, or obesity, which is an extreme of body mass or fat mass, um, that that very much reflects the population distribution of that measure which means that um, obesity is not a problem of obese people or overweight people. It is a problem for all of us. It is, it is a reflection of the distribution of body mass or fat mass within the entire society. And if you want to really have an impact on the, uh, on the burden of disease in the entire society, what you have to do is move the entire distribution curve down. And so uh, he very eloquently wrote that mass disease and mass exposures require mass remedy, remedies. The occurrence of deviance, so deviance in this case would mean, for example, very high body mass or very high fat mass, and its associated distress reflect population-wide characteristics. And that prevention calls for acceptance of a collective responsibility. As Dostoevsky wrote, we are all responsible for all. Childhood obesity, obesity in general, this is a population problem. This is a mass problem which is due to mass exposures and therefore this is something which is for all of us. And I have to say I, I very much think that that's the spirit of this meeting and I congratulate you um, for, um, uh, for, for doing this. Okay, so what kind of strategies, what kind of population strategies might one consider to get rid of the, uh, of the dietary toxins that we are currently exposed to. So one um, perhaps intuitively simple approach is to simply ban them. Um, and uh, this is something which has been attempted um, and in some cases with some success. Uh, as, as many of you know, in New York City, trans fats were banned, I think this was about 10 years ago, um, and a number of other um, metropolitan areas have done the same. I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. There's a trans fat ban in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland. And um, this has actually been quite successful. Um, this is an article that appeared in Annals a few years ago uh, where a group of investigators actually sampled restaurant food. And uh, what they found was that over time, uh, the, um, the, the um, presence of trans fats in restaurants food went, went way down. So in fact, uh, the ban was really working. Now one of the concerns was that what, what um, the food folks would do is they would increase the amount of saturated fat, which, were kind of, which might partially defeat the purpose. There actually was a slight increase in saturated fat, but it wasn't by very much. And so the conclusion was that this kind of population-based approach uh, this is a preventive, population preventive strategy. This has nothing to do with behavior. This is get rid of the toxin and get it out of the environment. And the conclusion of this is that this seemed to be working. Now, as many of you may know, uh, Michael Bloomberg, um, the former mayor of New York City, um, is a very uh, strong champion of public health. And so he next decided to attack sugar. And uh, here he was, um, New York City was uh, 
uh, definitely less successful. So one of the things that he tried to do was to um, uh, ban very high, uh, big size, large serving uh, soft drinks. Um, and um, that, that didn't go very far. He, he, they, they got the law passed, but it was challenged in court, uh, and the court eventually um, threw it out. And the argument was is that this, this is an infringement upon liberties, upon freedoms. We should be allowed to drink however much soda we want to. And uh, for the government to be taking a position or to try to ban that is something which is not uh, acceptable. So there, this, uh, there was some, um, some pushback. So this has raised a question of some other strategies that one might use to uh, get rid of the toxins in our environment or at the very least um, to, uh, uh, to mold human behavior uh, in, um, in a population-wide way uh, mold human behavior so as to decrease exposure to those toxins. And this is described in a, a really neat book by uh, Toller and Sunstein called uh, Nudge. Uh, some people call this the, the classic work of behavioral economics. How many of you have read Nudge? Okay, so a few of you have. And Nudge opens up with a, with a, a, um, uh, a story which is very apropos of this conference. And the story is about someone who is designing a cafeteria for children. And the question is, how do I design this cafeteria? Where do I put things? If I put the candy at the very front, you can bet the kids will take the candy. If I make it more difficult for them to get the candy and I put maybe the carrots up front, then maybe they, be, they might be more likely to take the carrots than to take the candy. Uh, this deals with the idea of something that they refer to as choice architecture. We are constantly making choices. And um, this morning, you know, we had to make a choice about, you know, do we get coffee or tea or do we put sugar in our coffee or, or do we put something else in our coffee or nothing in our coffee. And, uh, and how, how the uh, environment is set up affects our choices. So a classic example that, that they bring up is um, retirement plans. Um, so what um, many uh, organizations do is when they hire a new employee, they ask them um, uh, whether or not they want to enroll in an retirement plan, a retirement plan. And if they do, then they have to do a bunch of things, fill out a bunch of forms, and, um, and then they're enrolled in a retirement plan. How many of you belong to organizations that work like that? Okay, so most of you. Um, some organizations have taken a different approach. Uh, which is, uh, they've noticed that people generally do not save for retirement. In fact, the average household, when they reach retirement, have only $86,000 in savings, which is why people have to continue to work um, for much longer periods of time than they might have liked to. And so what they, what they do instead is a, a, a company or an organization brings in a new employee and they say, congratulations, you are enrolled in our retirement plan. Uh, X amount of money will be, with, will be deducted from your paycheck every month. And um, if you don't want that, that's fine. Just let us know. You can opt out. How many of you belong to those kinds of organizations? So a very few of you do. Uh, but what has been shown is that by doing this, one can increase the rate of uh, saving in a good quality retirement plan from, say, 20% to 90, 98%. One can have a dramatic impact on behavior, so be it, if you want to call it that, um, by changing the choice environment in that particular way. So this is an example. One couldn't imagine that if we had a population approach where uh, every organization did this, uh, then the, uh, the situation that uh, our older population may find themselves in will be dramatically improved um, by virtue of changing the environment in this way. Now, the other, the other thing that, that these authors talk about is they, they also talk about obesity and how choice architecture affects obesity. And part of the reason why um, obesity may be particularly relevant here is because of some fascinating work that's been done showing that obesity is very much tied to social networks, also consistent with the idea that obesity is really a public health problem. And this was uh, nicely described in a paper by uh, Fowler and Christakis. It was based on the NIH-supported uh, Framingham Heart Study. Um, and uh, they uh, found that effectively obesity is what they called contagious. That if you, have, if you are normal weight and you have friends who are obese, you are more likely to become obese uh, over time. 
And so they write here that the observation that people are embedded in social networks suggests that both good and bad behaviors might spread over social ties. And this highlights the necessity of approaching obesity not only as a clinical problem, but also as a public health problem. Now, along with that paper, there was an editorial that was written by uh, uh, Alberto um, Barabasi, Albert uh, uh, Barabasi. Uh, Barabasi is a computer scientist, computer engineer, um, who is, uh, became interested in how websites are linked to one another. And then this led to the publication of another absolutely fascinating book called uh, Linked. I'm just curious how many of you have read this one. I don't, okay, a few of you have. This is also an, an absolutely fascinating read, um, talking about how these links occur. And there seem to be certain kinds of phenomenon among links that uh, transcend all of nature, uh, from stars to molecules to protein networks to social networks to obesity. And so what, uh, what Barabasi wrote about in, in his editorial was how we should think about obesity as not an isolated problem, but something that occurs within a network of actually of many networks, a network of diseases, or on a higher level, network within a population, or on a lower level, networks of molecular pathways um, uh, as well. And uh, if we're going to really try to understand this problem and understand how to lick it, um, we have to think of it as being part of a, uh, a much greater uh, interconnected whole. Now, uh, I'm now going to go to some other questions. Um, so we talked about one question, one sort of overarching question, which is whether or not we should think of obesity as being primarily a clinical problem or a, prevent, or a population problem. And there is a great deal of evidence to suggest that like cholera, obesity is, is more of a population problem than, than just a clinical one. Um, another is whether or not uh, it's all about calories. And uh, there is this model that uh, obesity is due to too many calories going in and not enough calories going out. Uh, and where those calories actually come from doesn't really matter so much. And this has been the subject of a great deal of debate. And I'm sure there are people in this room here who know a lot more about this than I do. How many of you have read Gary Taub's book? Okay, so uh, only a few of you, I'm surprised. Um, so this is worth reading. Now, Gary Taubes, a lot of my colleagues can't stand them, and, and they get very upset when I even mention his name. Um, but it's an interesting read. And, and I have to tell you, he asks some really rather fundamental questions, like why is it that public health interventions are not subject to the same kinds of rigorous science that other kinds of interventions are? Why haven't we done large-scale randomized trials to determine whether or not the public health advice we're giving people is really worthwhile? Now, in the case of cholera, that wasn't necessary. In the case of cholera, where by, where by implementing uh, sanitation, one drove the, uh, the, the cholera rate down to essentially zero, that is a case where the effect is so enormous that there is no need to do a randomized trial. But for most of what we are talking about, the effects are much more modest and therefore randomized trials are critical. So here's a randomized trial. This was funded by NIH that was published just a few weeks ago um, in Annals of Internal Medicine. It was a trial of 150 people. They were randomized to a, uh, um, a, a low fat diet versus a low carb diet, similar calories. And uh, the low carb diet led to um, a, de a greater decrease in weight and a greater improvement in a variety of metabolic indices. There have been a number of such studies that have been published. Here's another question. So the boa constrictor where, that we started with raises the question about having whole organisms inside you. Now, the boa constrictor has like a whole elephant or a whole deer um, inside it. We also have whole organisms inside us. Um, and that's, those, are our, that's, those are our bacteria, our microbiomes. Um, it turns out that uh, over, well over 90% of the DNA inside our bodies is not human DNA. It's DNA that comes from um, bacteria. And so there has been some fascinating work lately, and, um, and quite a bit of it has been funded by NIH, um, suggesting that, uh, that obesity is related to the composition and behavior of our microbiomes. Uh, perhaps the way diet affects obesity is that what we eat affects the composition of the bacteria inside our guts. 
And what's been um, particularly fascinating is uh, work that's been done in animal models where uh, fecal transplantation uh, seems to transmit the phenotype uh, of uh, obesity. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a neat study that was published uh, last year, uh, also funded by um, NIH, in which uh, these investigators took twins, human twins, one twin being obese, one twin being lean, and uh, transplanted their, uh, their, microbiota, their gut microbiota into uh, germ-free mice. And uh, those mice that received the uh, bacteria from the, um, uh, from the obese twins got fat. And those that, uh, that received their bacteria from the lean twin remained uh, lean. And so uh, there, there's an, an interesting commentary that went along with this called Fighting Obesity with Bacteria. And I think the point here is that um, it certainly seems that those who have questioned the calorie hypothesis and have wondered whether or not there's something more complicated going on, perhaps the composition of the calories or perhaps the bacteria that are living inside us that um, are also participating in our uh, dietary habits or excesses, um, that those bacteria may play a major role in determining uh, who's obese. Well, here's another interesting question. Um, if uh, calories are bad, if having too many calories are bad, then perhaps substituting those calories with non-caloric non substitutes would be a good thing. And so um, there has been a dramatic increase um, over the last few decades, uh, and uh, perhaps even more recently with the worry about um, the harms of sugar, in the use of, uh, of non-caloric artificial sweeteners. So this is a paper that came out in Nature last week. This uh, was released last Thursday, uh, partially funded by NIH. This was primarily done at the Weizmann Center in Rehoboth, Israel. Uh, artificial sweeteners induce glucose intolerance by altering the gut microbiota. And what the, this is an, an incredible piece of science. Uh, what they started with was they, they took uh, germ-free mice um, and um, they, they gave them these uh, uh, these um, uh, non-caloric uh, non artificial sweeteners, uh, and uh, they found that uh, depending upon uh, what they then did with their gut microbiota, they could induce glucose intolerance in these mice. And the degree of glucose intolerance was at least as great, if not even greater, um, than that would, be, that would be seen with, high, with a high glycemic um, diet. They found that they were able to prevent this by giving um, certain kinds of antibiotics. They were able to describe the kind of bacterial changes that occur uh, with the advent of glucose intolerance that was stimulated by non-artificial sweeteners. They then took this to humans, and uh, they, they did some epidemiologic work, and then they also did a small uh, trial uh, where they randomized um, uh, uh, normal, healthy humans uh, and found that they were able, who, who do not use uh, artificial sweeteners, and they found that they were able to induce glucose intolerance in these people um, by giving them um, artificial sweeteners. And so their conclusion here is that artificial sweeteners, um, they were introduced into our diets with the intention of reducing caloric intake and normalizing blood sugar uh, without compromising the human sweet tooth. Together with other major shifts that occurred in human nutrition, the increase in artificial sweetener consumption uh, coincides with the obesity and diabetes epidemics. And our findings suggest that these artificial sweeteners may have directly contributed to enhancing the exact epidemic that they were intended to fight. Now, we'll see whether or not this bears out. I'm sure other people are going to try to replicate these findings. Um, but the key point here is, is that here were some people who were willing to ask some questions. They were willing to to ask a question like whether or not uh, totally non-caloric foodstuffs or uh, products uh, might actually be dangerous. Now, I'm going to end uh, by talking about uh, questions about us. Uh, at NIH, we give out contracts and grants to support research. And there is a reasonable question as to whether or not we're doing a good job and whether or not we are uh, setting our research agenda in an appropriate way. Uh, and some people have questioned this, and I'm going to uh, sh share with you a little bit about how we've gone about thinking about this. 
So this is now where we're totally switching gears. Here's a paper that came out in the British Medical Journal a little over two years ago that suggested that about 50% of NIH-funded trials uh, which are completed do not have their main results published within two and a half years of publication. And in many cases, the trials are not published at all. And this, I have to say, when this came out, uh, it was met with uh, both concern as well as disbelief. I mean, we, we just could not believe that our trials uh, were not getting um, published. And uh, this was taken seriously um, by some folks at Congress. This was a letter that Francis Collins uh, received from the uh, chair of the Senate House and uh, en the, of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, and it starts, uh, Dear Dr. Collins, we are writing to express our concern. Whenever we get a letter from Congress that starts with, we are writing to express our concern, this is not good. And uh, anyway, the letter goes downhill from there. Uh, and the end of the first paragraph says that this study uh, suggests, uh, raises concerns about whether NIH is adequately implementing the law. Uh, in other words, maybe NIH really isn't doing its job. If we're funding trials and, the, and those trials results are not getting published, that is a complete waste. No, no, you know, we may, ne may, never has, may as well never have done those studies in the first place. So I'm happy to say that one of my colleagues decided to take this very seriously. This is David Gordon. Uh, David Gordon uh, has been at NIH for uh, a number of decades now. He's a very experienced clinical trialist. He was involved with some of the early lipid studies. And uh, he and, um, led a group of people, uh, and I was very um, privileged to be able to work with him. Uh, and we spent um, not quite two years working on this. I'd say it took about a year, uh, one sequester, and a government shutdown. Uh, we published this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine last November in which we looked to see whether or not trial, cardiovascular trials uh, funded by the NIH are in fact getting published. Now, we had a whole lot of concerns with the methodology that was used in the British Medical Journal paper, and so we decided to take a much more comprehensive look at it. And uh, we basically found uh, two things. One is, is that those trials that focused on clinical endpoints, like uh, death, myocardial infarction, stroke, uh, those uh, trials, they published very fast. Those were these trials. Uh, they essentially all of them got published within two years. Um, these are the, the big flashy trials that appear in the New England Journal and JAMA, and they, uh, they appear on the front page of the New York Times. But they only accounted for less than 20% of our trials. The vast majority of our trials focus on surrogate endpoints, and these trials published very slowly. At the end of a year, only 10% of those, a year after those trials were finished, only a year had had their main results published. And over two and a half years, less than 50% had their results published. And so this raised an interesting question that Salim Yusuf asked in an editorial that went along with our paper, saying when it comes to trials, do we get what we pay for? And the answer is, well, maybe. In, in some respects, yes. There are some trials that we do get what we pay for. But there's a huge number of trials that NIH seems to be funding that we're not getting what we pay for. And so uh, uh, Salim and, and his colleague PJ Devereaux suggested that maybe we should change our priorities. So here was a, a way in which um, my colleague David, by asking a question about whether or not we were doing a good job, um, was able to use the tools of science and figure out that maybe we're not doing such a good job. And, uh, and perhaps we should change the way we make our decisions. And in a way, this is really part of a much bigger problem. Um, this is Jim Langer. Jim Langer is a physicist. He was formerly the uh, vice president of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, he wrote this uh, editorial a couple of years ago talking about how the, biomed the system of supporting biomedical research in this country is failing. And it's failing because it's contracting. However, we all think that it's expanding. And, uh, and because it is contracting, uh, we have to change the way we make our decisions. He argues that uh, funding agencies have to uh, recognize that it is humanly impossible to figure out which research is going to have the highest uh, impact. Uh, and therefore, we have to find alternate ways uh, of figuring out which projects to support. And then the uh, last sentence there was, that will be hard. <laughs> Um, and uh, this has uh, been expressed in other venues as well. This is a, a very nice piece uh, 
um, that came out in PNAS earlier this year. Uh, it was written by Harold Varmus, uh, who is the, uh, formerly the director of NIH, now the director of the Cancer Institute, uh, as well as Bruce Alberts, who was formerly the editor-in-chief um, of Science. And um, he and two of their colleagues talk about uh, rescuing the, the system for funding biomedical research from its flaws. The long-held but erroneous assumption of never-ending growth has created an unsustainable, hyper-competitive system. The problems cannot be solved with simplistic approaches. It is time to confront the dangers and rethink some fundamental features of U.S. biomedical research. Now, how do we do, how do we make our decisions? For the most part, we make our decisions by having grant proposals come in that get reviewed by study sections, and then those study sections uh, give these grant scores, and those grants get the best scores are the ones that get funded. How many of you have ever been uh, involved in any way with, a, with this system? You know, you've submitted a grant, you've served in the study section, so most of you have. Um, and um, this is not an evidence-based system. Uh, the Cochrane Review noted that uh, the evidence of the effects of this approach um, are scarce. And so uh, we decided to take a look at this, and now we've published a couple of papers. We looked at the, uh, at the uh, ability of the peer review score, the percentile ranking, to predict uh, the citation impact of a grant. Would a grant produce um, a large number of papers? And if they do produce papers, are those papers likely to be highly cited? And what we found was that there's no association whatsoever between the uh, peer review percentile ranking, the score that the um, peer reviewers gave, and, uh, and the, uh, the citation impact. None. The, the association is completely flat. Now, what we also found was that uh, prior productivity of investigators is predictive, that an investigator who is highly productive who writes a lot of papers or who writes papers that are highly cited, in the years before their grant gets funded, they are more likely to uh, oversee a grant which is going to have higher impact. And this led to a great deal um, of uh, reaction. Uh, Science Magazine posted a piece, um, a three-page piece, about the problems with the peer review system. Here was an interesting piece that came out in the Wall Street Journal by Farrak Fang and Arturo Cavadasal. It says, NIH's peer review system has been criticized. The latest uh, critique uh, is a study that was just published from uh, colleagues at NHLBI. Uh, other studies have reported that the NIH peer review system lacks statistical rigor, and we suggest another approach, and their approach was a lottery system. Now, um, by the way, others have suggested this too, and the idea, what they're suggesting is, is that Peer review would only be asked, is this a meritorious study, yes or no? Don't, we're not asking you to say whether it's an A plus or a B minus, just ask us what, just uh, tell us whether or not this, there's something to it. And if, if the answer is yes, then it goes into a pool, and then other approaches, including possibly a lottery, could be used to figure out what actually gets funded. Um, so we do have to question ourselves, and uh, this is a piece that John Ioannidis wrote some years ago. Um, in nature, um, and it is a scandal that billions, in fact tens of billions of dollars are spent every year funding biomedical research and we do not know the best way to allocate um, that money. And I'm happy to say that uh, we're, we, as long as a, a number of other people outside of NIH, are now starting to take a hard look at this and not only throw questions at problems like obesity, but also throw questions at problems like how do we make decisions about how to fund problems like obesity, because that itself is something which is worthy of questions and worthy of scientific um, investigation. So let me conclude with this comment by uh, um, Phil Tetlock. Phil Tetlock is a psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania. His uh, area of interest is experts and expert opinion. And he did a study some years ago where he looked at the, um, the accuracy of expert predictions. He's particularly interested in political science, so he was looking at uh, predictions like uh, who will win the war or who will win an election or whether or not there will be a coup. And uh, what he found was that uh, the accuracy of expert prediction is no greater than chance. The accuracy of expert opinion prediction is no greater than chance. What he also found was that those experts who were very confident about their predictions were the ones who were most likely to be wrong. Um, 
who were the experts who were more likely to be correct? The ones who were more likely to be correct were those who asked questions, were those who said, well, I don't know who's going to win the election, but I might think that if the economy goes this way, then this candidate might benefit. And that's a question I might ask. Or I might think that if a particular voter group turns out more than another voter group, that that may affect the outcome uh, of the election. And so maybe what I ought to do is try to figure out which voter group is going to turn out more often. And those experts who reframed their opinions or their predictions by focusing on questions, they're acting like great scientists. And the little prince would have been happy with them. And so that takes me now to my final book. Now, how many of you have read this? Okay. Um, now, we've read in our family, we've read all seven books, and um, we've read all seven multiple times. Um, and this is, of course, J.K. Rowling's classic um, on uh, Harry Potter. My wife pointed out that um, if you think about it, um, solving the problem of Voldemort uh, was also a problem that um, involved uh, multiple, multiple complex components that were all linked to each other. There were seven horcruxes and somehow they had to figure out how they were linked to each other. And uh, Albus Dumbledore pointed out that happiness can be found even in the darkest of times uh, when one only remembers to turn on the light. And uh, the way we turn on the light um, in science uh, is by asking questions. So I want to congratulate all of you for putting this conference together and for asking some really terrific questions. And I also want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lauer, for a stimulating and thought-provoking uh, uh, lecture. So uh, we will open now for questions. And since I'm up here, I get to start. How's that? Uh, I, I recommend that you have another slide that you can put in with those crazy statements, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be the Michael Moss book on sugar, fat, uh, and salt as the cause of the obesity epidemic. I think there's no compelling evidence that at least Americans are eating any more of those things over the last 30 years, or that we're eating any more calories over the last 30 or 40 years. There's just no evidence that we're eating more. So what's the cause then of the obesity epidemic? You know my bias. It's declining yeah. energy expenditure, and you didn't address that. Well, um, I guess we'll have to beg to differ. Because <laughs> um, my, my understanding is, is that, um, I mean, there's, there are certain components in our diet that didn't even exist. High fructose corn syrup didn't exist uh, until the 1970s. It was introduced into our diets at that time. Um, the, um, uh, a long time ago, we didn't eat processed foods because processed foods didn't exist. Uh, we ate, Michael Pollan talks about um, food. Uh, so food is things like, you know, whole pieces of, of, of uh, meat or fish or um, vegetables. And um, these days, that makes up a much lesser component of our, of our diet. One of the problems that people have pointed out is, is that eating food, eating uh, vegetables and fruit is hard. It, it's not only the, the, the issue of being able to get them and have access to them in your neighborhoods, but it requires real work to put together meals that are based on food um, as opposed to processed food. And that was something that the, that the food companies figured out, that uh, this, was something, this was a way in which they could sell their products. So um, uh, certainly, I, I think about the diet that, I, that, that many of the people around me eat now, and it's certainly very different than what we were eating back in the 1960s. But it hasn't changed much for salt, sugar, and fat. And high fructose corn syrup is a tiny, tiny fraction. But anyway, we can beg to give her, okay. give her on that. Very That's good. fine. I'm sure there are other smarter questions out there. Yes, ma'am. I'm at Georgia. Um, I have a question about the allocation of NIH funding and how those decisions are made. I've sat on study sections, and I'm sure a lot of people have here. You talked about how uh, what makes sense is investing in researchers who have previously been productive. And I, I understand that, but I also understand there's an element of self-fulfilling prophecy here. Once you get the reputation for being a great mm -hmm. researcher, of course, you'll be cited more. But what that does is it kind of shuts the door to women, to younger scientists, to people who might have really cool and innovative ideas, 
but who are not going to get those uh, grants, especially with the pay lines as low as they, uh, as they are right now. And I, and I find this disturbing, and no wonder people like Fran Visco of the Breast Cancer Coalition say scientist, uh, science is too important to be left to scientists. I mean, I know NIH is under pressure now about, uh, you know, should, should consumers be setting the research agenda for cancer? Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to hear your thoughts on where we are at this particular inflection point. Yeah, I, I think your points are, are, are excellent. Um, so um, one issue is, is that uh, we're currently grappling with the idea of funding people as opposed to projects. Um, work has been done showing, for example, that Howard Hughes investigators, Howard Hughes investigators are funded based on who they are as opposed to what they're proposing. Um, and there's been work showing that they are, uh, that they're more innovative, their work is more innovative and more productive and more impactful. But you are right, one of the concerns is, is that it may shut out um, newer investigators, it may shut out some people with some really wild and crazy ideas. Um, and so, therefore, any kind of a system that is going to focus more on people or programs as opposed to specific projects will have to take that into account. And I think that's eminently doable, but that will require some work. Uh, so, for example, uh, we could have early stage investigators compete against other early stage investigators. We could have uh, um, innovative uh, projects that are supposed to be innovative compete against other projects that are supposed to be innovative. So, th there are ways in which this, this could be um, approached, but you are right that it's something that does um, need to be uh, considered. Uh, the idea of bringing in um, non-scientists uh, into the process and making decisions about funding is also a fascinating one. Um, I've had the great privilege of working uh, with the folks at PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and we published a paper just this past summer in which we looked at what happens when you include patients and non-scientist stakeholders into the peer review process. And it's fascinating. And, and what we are finding is, is that they are contributing to the peer review process. They are affecting the, the, the thinking uh, of scientists, and they are affecting uh, the decision making um, on, on funding. Uh, and so that is something that is also, um, uh, right now, it's, it's not only just being entertained, it's, it's something which is actually happening. Uh, so I think you, you make a number of excellent points. Um, there are, we don't, we, the bottom line is we do not know the best way to figure out which projects to fund. And, uh, and so a number of people have called upon the funding agencies to engage in experiments, experiments on themselves. Um, and I think that's a great idea. And I hope that uh, maybe a few years from now, if you invite me back to this conference, I'll tell you about some of them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good morning. Ed, Ed Frangelo, uh, South Carolina. Uh, I, I really appreciate and, and thank you for your thoughtful presentation. I was curious, you contrasted the clinical high-risk targeted approach with a population approach. So as, as you see us going forward, how can the funding stream and incentives for, for scientific work around, say, obesity be shifted more towards population approaches rather than smaller scale clinical approaches? Um, so that's a great question. You know, how, how do we actually accomplish that? If that's something that we actually want to do, uh, how do we uh, accomplish that? Um, well, one, one um, this, this also gets to the heart of another question about how NIH should fund research, which is whether or not we should be targeting the kind of research that we fund versus whether or not we should basically um, uh, have the scientific community um, direct that. And obviously there needs to be um, a balance. We, we are funding some projects that focus on community and, uh, and uh, population-based approaches. Uh, one such project is the Healthy Community Study, which NHLBI is currently funding. And this is a, uh, an observational, large-scale observational study, which is trying to figure out uh, which community programs seem to have the greatest impact on the, on the development of childhood obesity or on, on, uh, on the trajectory of various behaviors and body mass um, in children. Um, but, you know, right now, I don't think we have a, uh, we're, we're trying to develop a more coherent strategy, but whether or not we should even have a coherent strategy is something which, which has been questioned. I would say one thing, which is that uh, very, 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 very expensive clinical trials we can no longer afford. Uh, and so trials that, um, for example, some of these feeding studies cost twenty to $25,000 per research subject, and I don't think we, we can afford that anymore. Um, so uh, creative and imaginative ways in which one can conduct large-scale trials at very low cost, that's something which would be very attractive to us. Uh, particularly at a time when our, when our budgets are low. 
And we know of people who are coming up with some, with some very creative approaches um, to doing that. And uh, those, those kinds of studies are more likely to be funded simply by virtue of the fact that, that they, they appeal to us um, by potentially having high impact and also having lower budgets. Yeah. I think we have time for a short question and a relatively short answer. Um, you know, there's always room for improvement, and uh, when a system is stressed, one wants to, wants to make difference to improve things. But, you know, I mean, from the 10,000-foot view, um, you know, American science is, is, has been incredibly productive. If you look at any metric, number of publications, number of Nobel Prize, win uh, Prize winners, number of patents, um, there's clearly a lot of things that the NIH has done right, and there's clearly a lot of elements to the system that make it, I mean, one of the best meritocracies probably we have in the federal government. So uh, I worry about throwing out the baby with the bathwater here. Could you comment on that? Yes. So you're right. Um, the, um, the productivity of American science has been absolutely amazing. But what we also have to do is not rest on our laurels. And what we um, have seen is that the, uh, the productivity uh, of science in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe and now in Asia, has been rapidly on the increase. And by a variety of measures, the productivity of American science has either remains flat or may actually be in a state of decline. Now, part of it is because of decreasing budgets. I mean, that, that's a reality. Um, and, you know, as Teddy Roosevelt said, you've got to work with what you have. So, you know, we're not going to make that reality go away. But um, other countries have been able to figure out ways in which to get their scientific enterprises to be increasingly more and more productive, despite the fact that they spend a lot less money on research than we do. Uh, so we have to figure out a way um, of doing that. We have to be willing to question it, and we have to be willing to say, just because the system worked fine 10, 15, or 20 years ago, that business model may no longer be appropriate for, for what's happening today. And you obviously don't like that, but okay. <laughs> I, I have one more suggestion for the lottery, and that would be Bill Congress. How about that? Yeah. It's just I mean, well, like, like we do juries. I, I, let me, let me, I'm going to be tongue in cheek, but there's a member of Congress who is a member of one of our studies. Now, you can imagine that that member of Congress is very, uh, is very engaged by NIH science and supports NIH science. Imagine if we were able to do clinical trials that involved the majority of the population. Right now, less than Less than 10% of Americans have ever been asked to participate in clinical research. Imagine if we had a, a world in which 50% of, of all Americans participate in clinical research, which might mean that, say, 60 to 70% of members of Congress participate in clinical research. You'd have a completely different um, environment. And so, I mean, I think this is another example of where, despite the successes that we've had, uh, the current business models are not working. And, uh, and, to, and to simply say, well, let's just stick with the business models that we've had before and not ask any questions is not going to help us. Now, it may very well be that as we ask questions, uh, we may not come up with anything better. And, and that's okay. But, uh, but as good scientists, uh, it is our responsibility to uh, not jump to conclusions and be willing to ask questions, including questions that make us very uncomfortable. Well, this was a terrific, thought-producing lecture. Let's give a Great. big Thank ovation. Thanks, Steve. A lot of fun. Very good.